Hello and welcome to the programme where you can help solve crime. As always, what you see tonight will be for real, with actual witnesses and with information from police files never previously revealed. Maybe you'll find that you know something the police don't know. If so, the detectives behind me are waiting for your call. In case you do see something you recognise, be ready to write things down. Here's the main number, 01811-8055. But we'll have other numbers for you throughout the country. If you'd rather not speak to a police officer, you can talk in absolute confidence to a BBC researcher. And it really works. Thanks to your calls, Crime Watch has consistently achieved results. In fact, this is the tenth edition of Crime Watch, and it's our first anniversary. I can tell you that as a direct result of your calls over the past year, 30 people have been arrested, and many now face serious charges in connection with very violent crimes. For example, last month, police investigating the murder of Pamela Reynolds in Worthing needed to trace a particular car. Well, a viewer, an off-duty policeman as it happens, recognised that car, called in, and a man was arrested in Betsy Coed in North Wales. He has now been charged with murder. And uh, still in North Wales, we ask for your help in solving the disappearance of Mrs Mifanwy Jones, who went missing from her home in Cordwen on the 4th of January. Sadly, we have to report that last Friday in Bala, 15 miles away, Mrs Jones's body was found. She'd been murdered. Police are now excavating the area in the search for Mrs Peggy Goodman, who you may remember also lived in Cordwen and went missing in December 1982. We'll keep you informed. Last month, we asked for help in the case of the Hastings fire in which two children died. We showed you this petrol can. It was found in the garden of the house where the fire started, and as a direct result of the programme, police are almost certain that the can was taken from a garage nearby. They're now pursuing this new line of inquiry. It's probably completely unconnected now, but on Sunday, February the 3rd, the morning after the fire, the body of a man who'd shot himself was found on the beach at Eastbourne. Police have made an artist's impression because they're not able to identify the body. They're anxious to find out who he was so they can inform friends or relatives. If you recognise him, please ring Hastings Police on 0424 425 0. That's 0424 for Hastings, 425 0. In July last year, we appealed for information about the murder of Caroline Osborne from Leicester. We had a large number of helpful calls, but the killing nonetheless remained a mystery. Then on April the 27th this year, there was another murder in Leicester. Amanda Whedon, a nurse, was found stabbed to death near the Gruby Road Hospital where she worked. A man was arrested in connection with that crime. He's subsequently been charged with both murders. And last month's Aladdin's cave of stolen property was our most successful yet. Every item but one from Cheshire Police, including all these porcelain figurines, proved to come from one burglary. And many of the items Hertfordshire Police wanted to identify have now been claimed by their rightful owners. We start this month with an armed robbery. Lothian and Borders Police, who asked for our help, say it was a miracle that no one was hurt in the affair. The reconstruction you're about to see is as accurate as possible, given eyewitness accounts. The robbers you see are, of course, actors, but they resemble eyewitness descriptions. Remember, people's memories aren't infallible, and no doubt it will emerge that some of the details turn out to be different. If you can give more information, or if you saw anything to do with a robbery, please do call us. It happened three months ago in Edinburgh. The date is Friday the 1st of March. The people of Edinburgh are to witness an extraordinary chase through the main streets of the city. This is Waterloo Place in the centre of Edinburgh. At 4.30pm, this blue Ford Cortina with three men inside stopped opposite the Edinburgh housing offices. The car had been stolen from Glasgow the day before. One man stayed outside and one went inside as though he was a council tenant here to pay his rent. But instead of going to the counter, he sat with cleaners who were waiting for the offices to close. Several minutes later, a Securicor van arrived to collect the day's takings from the cashiers, leaving a guard to keep watch in the back of the van.
Normally, the guards would have collected the money and come straight out, but today the cashiers weren't ready and there was a 15 minute wait. This long delay enabled witnesses in the building to give a very full description of one of the robbers. He seemed about 30 years old, six feet tall, well built with black, straggly, unwashed hair and a scruffy moustache. He had a pale complexion. It's now 4.45 p.m. It seems that by looking through the window into the cashier's office, the accomplice outside was able to give a signal that the guards were about to emerge. Attack, 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 394, Housing Department, Waterloo Place. Get down! So hold up, get down! The second impact caused the van to swerve and hit a parked car. As the Cortina sped down the Royal Mile, the robbers found they were on their own. For the moment, they'd got away. Turn right! At the bottom of the Royal Mile, they swerved right into the car park of Scottish and Newcastle breweries. The van had lost them from its sight and drove straight past. Over a dozen witnesses saw the men running through the car park. Several said that one was now wearing a bright red sweater. The Securicor van had lost them, and with a burst radiator, it had to give up the chase. Inspector Tom Snedden is the man, the detective now hunting for the robbers. How can the public help? Well, I would ask anyone who witnessed the robbery or the subsequent chase through the streets of Edinburgh to contact us if we've not already interviewed them. Now, as we said, we've got a very good description of at least one of the, one of the robbers. Just, just tell us again what we know about him. I think it's important to emphasise the point that uh, the men are actors. The description of the gunman He's about six feet, approximately 30 years of age. He's well built. He was unshaven. He's got a moustache. He's got black straggly hair. It's unwashed, falling over his forehead. 
We know for a fact that he was wearing a blue parka jacket with a hood which is trimmed with fur. Right, and the second man? The second man and the third man, they're both rather patchy, the, the descriptions. The second man is approximately 25 to 30 years. He's 5 feet 7, he's well built. He's unshaven, he's possibly got a beard. He was wearing a um, ski cap, either brown or green, and a green jacket. The driver, who's the third man, he, in fact, has got short hair, he's about 27. He's clean-shaven, but we do have witnesses speaking to the fact that he's possibly got a bad complexion, pockmarked or spotted face. Now, you mentioned things that they were wearing. Uh, on the other hand, when we saw them in the last shot, as they were escaping from the car park, one of them, it seemed, was wearing a bright red pullover as they ran off into Hollywood Road. That's correct. Um, we believe that, in the fact, they've changed clothes in the car. You would also notice that uh, they were only carrying one bag uh, because there was four bags stolen and we believe they've put them into one whole doll. Right. Now, presumably, you lost sight of them after the car park, so you want anybody who might have seen suspicious people running away beyond that point? That is correct. Anyone in a red, uh, wearing a red jersey or carrying a whole doll in the area of Holyrood Road Right. Come forward. Now, I mentioned that the car had been stolen from Glasgow the day before, which was, if I remember correctly, February the 28th. Uh, it was stolen in Glasgow, the, the registration number, I've got it here, SSF 701V. Yes. Now, you need to know more about that car, presumably, where it was in the intervening 24 hours. The car was stolen from Langside College Car Park, which is near Battlefield Road in Glasgow. It was stolen approximately between 7.30pm and 9pm, and we would appeal to anyone who saw the car between these times and the time of the robbery to come forward. Right, so... It's the car you need to trace in that intervening 24 hours, though you've obviously got it back now. Yes. You need to find any of the three men responsible. You want to see anybody who saw the chase, whether or not they feel they've anything important to tell you? That is correct, because the, these men could be from any part of the country and uh, not necessarily from Edinburgh. And I would appeal to anybody who, in fact, uh, either knows the men from the descriptions or think they know them, to contact uh, myself or the uh, numbers given and they can speak to us in confidence. All right, Inspector Sneddon, thank you. Um, the number to ring, if you can help, is 01811 8055. Or you can call Lothian and Borders Police directly on Edinburgh 311 3131. That's 031, the code for Edinburgh, 311 3131. It was about this time last year that the papers were headlining the disappearance of seven-year-old Mark Tilsley from Wokingham. Despite a huge police inquiry, there's still no trace of Mark. It's a long shot, perhaps, hoping for new witnesses a year on. After all, hundreds of people have already tried to help. But Thames Valley Police have asked us to use the anniversary, which was two weeks ago now, to film a reconstruction and see if we could still jog a memory and provide a new and vital clue. Mark's home is in Wokingham, 10 miles from Reading in Berkshire. The fair was back in Wokingham this weekend, on the same ground at Wellington Road, where it's been each May or June for 50 years. Mark's home, too, was in the centre of Wokingham. The fair was a five-minute bike ride away. It's 50 miles away, on Friday, the 1st of June last year, at 7.20 in the morning, a lorry stops for a hitchhiker on the A30. Going to Wokingham? Yeah. The driver, Shane Northway, picked up his passenger 20 miles east of Salisbury, just outside Stockbridge. He remembers the man well. He had a bit, there was a little bit of odour there, and you could see him in sleeping rough. He had, there was dirt all around the collar of his shirt. His Mac was really filthy on the inside, red lining. Where you going, mate? I'm making my way around country looking for work. He was in the cab with me for about two and three quarter hours, and I eventually dropped him off just past the fairground in Wokenham. Yeah, you can drop me off here, mate, if you like. Do yeah, me. I'll just pull down the road out of the way of the traffic. All right. When the man got out, he headed back up Wellington Road towards the fairground. It was a busy time on the main road, 
and someone must have seen him. Bye bye, Mark. See you later. Mark's mother left home at 5.15 that evening to go to work. She hasn't seen Mark since. Bye. Mark left the house half an hour later, telling his father he was going to the fair. He was a quiet, shy boy, often to be seen on his bike in the town centre. The tiger jacket he wore that day was eye-catching and distinctive. Eyewitness accounts confirm that Mark was at the fair by 6.30 that evening. Two witnesses recall that a man appeared to be watching Mark. Police are also certain that an hour and a quarter later, Mark was still at the fair, now on the Dodgems. It's possible that the man who was with him was the same man who earlier had been watching him. He was about six feet tall with scruffy hair, very similar to the man dropped off earlier in the day by the lorry driver. Except this man had glasses. About 8 p.m., Mark leaves the fairground with the same man. Though he left his bike behind, Mark appears to have left the fair quite willingly. Correct for two points. Challenge or tell me yourself. It was this man, David Hine, who may have been the last person to see Mark Tildesley that Friday evening. If it was Mark, he was in Langborough Road, apparently with the same man he'd been with at the fair. Mark has never been seen again. His mother still refuses to believe the worst. I still say someone's got him and he's let, they're living in rough or something because it's a mother's instinct. I know he's all right. We still hope so. Detective Superintendent Tony Miller is now in charge of this investigation. Now, how likely is it that the hitchhiker, the man there at the fair, and the man we've just seen in Langborough Road are one and the same man, in fact? Quite frankly, we can't say positively. What I can say is I'm fairly sure that the man seen at the fair and the man in Langborough Road are one and the same. You will recall the description given of the man who had the lift by the lorry driver. It's not dissimilar to the man at the fairground. In fact, he was about 45 to 60 years of age. He had grey hair, browning, and indeed he was described as having a long nose. This was a feature about him, and also a beard growth, which indeed matched the man who was given the lift. Now, the man seen at the fair had spectacles on. So if we look at our video we fit, we can see what he might look like with glasses on. Right. Now, the hitchhiker in the lorry wasn't wearing any glasses, was he? Indeed he wasn't, and indeed the man in Langborough Road wasn't. But other than that, the descriptions are very, very similar. So what you want to do is for the man who was hitchhiking that ride in the lorry that day to at least come forward so that you can eliminate him? Indeed we would, yes. Well, if we can recap on his movements that day, the lorry driver picked up the hitchhiker on Friday the 1st of June, and that was just west of Stockbridge, and at 7.20 in the morning. They then travelled up the A30 and along the M3, and reached Wokingham at about 10 to 10, again that morning, and the driver dropped him off in Wellington Road, near to the fair. Now, do we know where he went after that? We don't, but perhaps we could start by going back to the commencement of that journey, and you will recall that he had a tachograph in his hand. We can see it there. And as the viewers can see. The reason I take you back there is because, indeed, this man may have been a lorry driver. If he was, uh, other persons may have given him a lift from Wokingham, if, in fact, they did, we'd like them to come forward. We should say that anybody who hitches the lift with one of, of the tachograph is saying to a lorry driver that, that he's another lorry driver. Indeed, that gives the indication, yes. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a conversation by this man with the lorry driver to the effect he was looking for casual labour fruit picking. I'd like to hear from anyone who gave employment of that nature to a man of that description. 
So somebody might remember picking up somebody with a tachograph because that was quite distinct. Indeed they might. Uh, as we've emphasised, we, if nothing else, we want to eliminate this man from the inquiry. Right. Now, you've traced so far about 400 people who were actually at the fair on that day. How many more people do you think you need to see? How many more people were there? I can't answer how many people were there, but what I can say is I want to speak to every person who went at the fair that evening. Indeed, uh, let us be the judge of what they saw uh, as to whether it's of evidential value. Please come forward and contact us. And just once again, we've seen the jacket in the film. Let's have one more look at it. You've brought it a facsimile of the jacket in with the tiger motif. Indeed. That's uh, the jacket, or very similar to the jacket that uh, Mark was wearing. And that might indeed attract the attention of persons that night. Right. So to sum up, you need to find the hitchhiker on that day, the one who hitched a ride in the lorry, anybody else who was at the fair that day to come forward who hasn't come forward already, and the man in Langborough Road who was seen in Langborough Road towards the evening. Indeed we would. In addition to that, I would also like to say, as a parent, as I'm sure many of the viewers are parents, we can only imagine the anguish this family have faced over the last 12 months. We will pursue the inquiry relentlessly. Please, if anyone has any information additional to what we've asked for, please come forward and contact us. Thank you very much indeed. And if you think you know anything that might help us to find Mark, here's the number again, 01 811 Or you can ring Thames Valley Police at Reading on 0734 585 one That's 0734, the code for Reading, 585 one On the Kramachuka incident desk last month, we asked for information about the disappearance of Mrs Evelyn Ake from her home in North Allerton. We've heard today that a man has been charged with her murder. With this month's cases, here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. First on incident desk, two men in Birmingham who've been regular visitors to the Leeds Permanent Building Society. On the 20th of March this year, they robbed the Sheldon branch, and this is the film from the security camera. If we stop there, we get a good look at the one with the gun. He's about five foot eight and well built. He wore brown trousers and a grey anorak. Perhaps someone will recognise the other man despite his false beard and moustache. He's only five foot six, very slim with short dark hair. He wore jeans and a black jacket. This method is the same they've used on other occasions. They've robbed at least two other building societies on the 26th of February in Spark Hill and most recently on the 11th of April in Quinton, both in Birmingham. So if you recognise either or both of them, give us a ring. On three occasions in February and March this year, a man called on families in the Stepney area of East London. He is claimed to be a health official and a doctor. In fact, on every occasion, he indecently assaulted members of the families concerned. He's described as well-built, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 8, and thought to be aged between 30 and 40. If you think you recognise him, give us a call. And a general word of warning. If a doctor calls on you unrequested and asks to do a medical examination, call the police. Real doctors don't make house calls unless you've asked for them. And should anyone claim to be a health worker, ask to see their identity card. This is one from Stepney, but they may look a little different in other areas. If they haven't got a card, don't let them in. On Sunday, May the 12th, a hand grenade was found in Station Road, Beaconsfield, in Buckinghamshire. The area was sealed off except for four builders working near a boutique who were allowed to stay where they were. At least, it was assumed they were builders. In fact, they were actually thieves. The bomb scare was a coincidence, but while it lasted, the men loaded up about £120,000 worth of designer clothes and shoes. They appeared in Vogue last month, and they're very distinctive. Names like Jasper Conran, Roland Klein and Caroline Charles, and are rarely offered at sale prices. These are exact copies of the stolen dresses. They would normally cost over £300 each. And have you seen any of the Charles Jordan shoes which were carted out of the shop in brown rubbish bags? All 300 pairs of them. And a final clue, the robbers used this jemmy to break in. It's made by Keen Tools and was probably sold in a small hardware shop where they've written the price on in felt tip. If you've sold it or if you've seen the dresses, we'd love to hear from you. This is Whittington Hospital, which is in Highgate in North London. On the 28th of May, 110 patients had to be evacuated because of a fire which was started deliberately. The damage to the building was estimated to be over half a million pounds, but thankfully, although lives were threatened, no one was actually hurt. The 28th of May was a Tuesday, the day after the bank holiday Monday, 
and the fire was discovered in a corridor at 8.50pm in the archway wing, only yards from acutely ill patients. It's believed the fire was started by someone setting alight cardboard boxes and linen baskets. Even if you think you can't help, we want to hear from everyone who visited the archway wing of the hospital on Tuesday. 28th of May, between 8 and 9 p.m., particularly visitors in wards A1 to A5. Thames Valley Police need your help to clear up a fraud. On the 15th of March, over £168,000 cash was paid out for some heavy plant machinery. The machinery was never delivered and the cash just disappeared. Detectives believe that this man, David Beetles, may be able to help their inquiry. Mr Beetles and his wife and two children have left their home in Wokingham. But he has connections in the Andover area, and we understand that he did have plans to buy a guest house in the West Country. So if you're an estate agent in the West Country, or if you've seen this man in your local, please give us a ring. And finally, a bit of a mystery. Sussex police need to find out where these came from. The brass crucifix would have had coloured enamel here, but most of it's worn off. And the candlesticks are both the same height, but made for candles of differing thickness. They look as though they may have once belonged in a church. Now, we can't tell you yet the story that lies behind these objects, but if you can tell us where they definitely came from, we may have an intriguing tale to tell you next month. And if you've anything to tell us about the cases on this month's incident desk, do give us a call. And the number to ring, if you can help in any way, is 01811-8055. 01811-8055. As you'll have observed, some of the reconstructions we show on Crime Watch are necessarily vivid and disturbing. In July last year, we reconstructed an attack on the customers of a pub in Liverpool. The violence that we showed so appalled some viewers that they were moved to give information. One of them was actually a criminal himself. As a result of those calls, Merseyside police arrested two men, and last week one was sentenced to 12 and the other to 16 years imprisonment. Our final case tonight is equally shocking. Again, we're showing you exactly what happened in the hope that someone, once again, will come forward. In the early hours of April the 22nd, Wallace and Mary Foster were attacked in their home in Surrey. The motive was clearly robbery, but because the attackers were so violent, they must be caught before they strike again. The language and the action is as accurate as possible. Our reconstruction begins at the Foster's home at Church House Antiques in Weybridge. Wallace and Mary Foster had retired to bed at about half past eleven that night. The younger of their two sons, Zenos, was asleep in the next room. The older one, James, slept on the other side of the house, above the shop. He very often went downstairs in the middle of the night to raid the fridge, so his parents were used to hearing occasional noises. It was just about two o'clock in the morning when intruders crept round the side of the house and into the back garden. There was no alarm system. The two men jemmied open the French windows, unheard. Wallace Foster was woken by noises inside the house. Then he heard the sound of the sliding door at the bottom of the stairs. Is that you, James? Yeah, yeah, it's me, Dad. Got problems. Get back! Back! The gun's loaded on so Okay, you want to go, do Both that. men spoke with London, though I not Cockney problem, accents. The dark-skinned man was in his late twenties to early thirties and heavily built. The white man was slim and looked younger than his partner. You got any bells? Just better go and find some. What's this then, eh? It's an air rifle. Don't look like an air rifle to me. Antique, is it? They were well enough informed about the family to know that they had two sons and they knew Mrs. Foster's first name, Mary. Now cut it out, lads. I've got kids in the house. Why don't you just take the money and go? All right, who's in the room next door? Right? He's five. Leave him alone. He'll sleep right through this. Yes. Where's the other one? one then, eh? He's in a separate flat on the other side of the shop. Have you got a telephone in there? I need an extension. Yeah, well, we'll hear it if he picks it up. Yeah, we'll hear it. <laughs> so it's a gun you're interested in, is it? But it's loaded, see? And there's the shells. Eat that pillowcase, Pat. Right, you got any suitcases? Yes. I'm gonna open the safe. Keys, keys to the safe. Does she know how to open the safe? Of course she knows how to open the safe. Check this, antique suitcases. Very nice. 
Come on, you. <laughs> Up. Come on, do you want some of this? Stay put! Yeah. Come on! Move it, move it! Down them stairs! Come on, Mary. There's Mary in it. Get in there. Right then, let's see what you've got, eh? Yeah. Now listen, if you don't do what I say, you're going to get hurt real bad. Understand? You're going to get raped. I've done this before, you know. Get over there and get a safe open. Move it! Come on, open it, woman! Come on! I warn you, I'm not used to opening this. Just get it done, will you? Come on, hurry it up! Right. Well, I've got it wrong. You <laughs> there are four numbers, and it's very difficult. So you please, if you calm down, I'll be able Come to... Come on, get this thing open, or you've got to get it real bad. Now, come on, for Christ's sake. Uh, Get out. Uh, it's the only place you keep valuables. In his hurry to grab as much as he could from the safe, the robber let a silver dish fall onto the floor. Just stay there, you won't get hurt, all right? What's going on? What's up? It's all right. Don't worry. It's sweet. Get back upstairs. Don't worry about the silver. Just take the cash, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Ah! Wallace was shot twice in the stomach before he managed to fire his gun, narrowly missing the villain's head. As he did so, a third shot hit him in the groin. He got loose! I've shot him! He's got a gun! Come on! Shit! In that final struggle, Mary was punched viciously in the face. The men escaped, leaving almost everything behind, except about £2,000 in cash and a few items of jewellery. Well, that was a month ago. Detective Superintendent John Gladwell, how are Mr and Mrs Foster now? Um, they're both, both remarkably well. Uh, Mrs Foster has slight bruising to the face. Uh, Mr Foster has a bullet still lodged in the base of his spine, which is causing him some concern and a little pain. But apart from that, doing very well. Well, perhaps we can try and help find those violent robbers tonight. There's quite a bit to go on, isn't there? You've had several witnesses come forward already. Yes, we have. Perhaps we, we've got a reconstruction of, of one witness who saw on the day before, the Saturday before the actual crime, in the afternoon. He's a driver of this car. He saw two men walking towards Church House Antiques. Now, the white man stopped to peer in the shop window, while the black man continued walking past the witness's car and then out of his sight. We don't know what he did in those few moments but he couldn't see him. Then, after a while, the black man returned and joined his companion at the shop window. They then walked back the same way they'd come. Which is slightly unusual behaviour. Have you got descriptions for those two uh, men? Yes, we have. Um, a better description of the black man than the white man, but the black man was 30 to 32 years of age, 5 foot 8 to 9, um, stocky build, about 12 or 13 stone. And the white man was the same age, 30 to 32, again 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9, slim to medium build. Right, one was the black man was heavy, the white man was, was slim. That's right. Now, there were about three hours before the attack took place, there were several witnesses who report seeing two very particular cars which were cruising around very close to church house antiques. It was a woman who noticed a pale blue Jaguar. She was in this car. She noticed a pale blue Jaguar and a metallic coloured Rover driving into the car park of KBC Limited, where she works. She'd stopped off to check security at the firm. Now, as she went into the car park, she saw two young women sitting in the Rover. And they were calling out to two men in the Jaguar. Now, as the witness walked back, the Jaguar pulled out of the car park and she particularly noticed that the driver was wearing a camouflage jacket. The rover then followed with the two young women.
Now, there's one other sighting, in fact, wasn't there? So we're going to have a look at that in a minute. Here it is. It was about 20 minutes later, a taxi driver passing Church House Antiques, and he had to slow down to avoid two parked cars. One of those parked cars was a Jaguar, and the other one a Rover. So do you think those two cars were linked with the crime? They were very close, weren't they? Yes, indeed they were. They were, in fact, seen three times. The first time was at 10.20 in a nearby car park. Um, we, we are very interested in these vehicles for obvious reasons. The driver of the Jaguar was wearing the camouflage jacket, which was similar to the camouflage jacket worn by the white intruder. Um, we've had no stolen vehicles um, from our area. We've had no stolen vehicles found abandoned in our area. So uh, we've reason to believe that the people that committed this crime used their own vehicle. And the taxi driver, our second witness, was carrying two passengers at the time, and they haven't come forward yet. No, that's, that's right. He was uh, carrying a male and a female who uh, he had picked up from Hussein's restaurant in Weybridge, and he had dropped them off in Sunnyside at Walton-on-Thames. And although we've appealed locally, they haven't yet come forward, and I appeal to them to come forward tonight. Right. Now, the two robbers left behind one vital clue. That canvas bag? Yes, it's, uh, it's a common bag, um, but uh, inside, painted in yellow, is a number, which may mean something to somebody. It's 113, then there's a gap, and then the figure 8, and on the line underneath, the letter S, or the figure 5. So that could be vital if somebody can tell us where that came yes, from. Yes, indeed, I would. Uh, what exactly, in the end, did they get away with? It wasn't very much in the end. No. Um, just a few pieces of jewellery, uh, three in, uh, in particular, we're very interested in because there's only been two of this kind made. Those two pieces on the screen now, there have only ever been two of each one ever made? That's right. So uh, and I would ask that uh, if anybody has bought these items or they've been offered for sale, if uh, they could also contact us. So once again, there's a lot of distinctive information. There's those, those pieces of jewellery, there are the two cars which are seen in the area. Yes. Anything else you'd like people to come forward with to help you? Uh, yes, if we're right in our assumption that the Rover and the Jaguar are involved in our offence, then obviously uh, these vehicles were in the Weybridge area for some three or three and a half hours. Um, and I would ask any person that was in the Weybridge area, particularly in the area of Church Street, to come forward if they haven't already been spoken to by a police officer. And there was one anonymous caller you told me about who you'd like to call you again. Yes, on the Sunday after the offence, uh, anonymous male phoned Mrs Foster at home and gave certain information about the, the black man and I would ask him to uh, come forward in confidence. Um, this was a particularly violent attack and uh, we must catch these men before they strike again. Mr Foster, fortunately, was very, very lucky, but uh, if they do strike again, the next victim may not be quite so fortunate. Mr Gladwell, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Indeed, we did uh, cut out a lot of the violence, so uh, if you know who they are, please do ring in. If you can help before these uh, two men strike again, this is the number. 018118055. 018118055. If you prefer, you can call Surrey Police at Adelston. The number there is Weybridge 45544. That's 0932 for Weybridge 45544. Now, if you haven't had a chance to write the other numbers down, they are all on CFAX, if you have that. That's on page 186, and they're there for the rest of the week. And if you don't have a telephone or can't get through, drop us a line. Here's the address, Crime Watch UK, BBC TV Centre, London W12 8QT. Our main number here is easy to remember, and we'll be here all evening until midnight, so please ring if you do think you can help in any way. As always, we'll be back to tell you what develops uh, in an hour from now. That's Crime Watch UK update here on BBC One. At, well, we're running a few minutes late, but just after five past eleven. If you can't stay up till then, please remember what we say each month. That is that we cover cases police are most anxious to solve. In other words, very violent and nasty crimes. But violence is the exception, not the rule. So please, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. And just before we go, in fact, take a look at these rather fine chairs. They're mahogany and leather with a carved crest and motto, and they belong to Edinburgh District Council. 64 of them have been stolen over a period of months while renovations have been in progress. Now, no councillor likes to lose his seat, so if you've seen them, please do give us a ring. We'll be waiting for your call for the moment. Good night. Good night.
Hello and welcome back. As always, the detectives here and police up and down the country have been busy with your calls and there have already been some results. Indeed. Uh, first, the armed robbery in Edinburgh, which resulted in an extraordinary car chase through the main streets of the city during the rush hour. It happened on Friday the 1st of March at around 5pm when two security guards, determined not to let the robbers escape, chased them and they eventually caught up with them in the Royal Mile at Cannondale. The robbers eventually got away, but Detective Inspector Tom Snedden is determined to catch up with them. What sort of response have you had? We've had an excellent response. We've had over 60 calls, three of which are very promising, um, in fact, giving names of suspects. What I'm actually looking for is further corroboration, and I would reiterate what already I said in relation to people phoning in. Uh, if they think they uh, recognise... Uh, anyone from the, either the foot of it or the descriptions, please phone. Now, of one man in particular who was inside the housing offices, we have a very, very good description indeed. Yes, that was the man with the gun. He's aged approximately 30 years, six feet tall, well built. He's pale complexion, black straggly hair, uh, unwashed, falling over his forehead. He's got a moustache. And, again, he was wearing the blue anorak. Now, we also need to trace that uh, Ford Cortina, SSF 701V, between the hours that it was stolen from Glasgow on the 28th of February to the following evening when it was used in the robbery yes. in, in Edinburgh. On the whole, have you got new evidence, new information you didn't have before the programme? Yes, we have. Good. All right. Well, the lines uh, are still open, and um, we'll give you more numbers later on this evening. And earlier this evening, we also appealed for new information about the disappearance of Mark Tilsley from Wokingham in Berkshire. In the early evening of June the 1st last year, seven-year-old Mark went to the local fair. The last known sighting of him just after eight o'clock in the evening was with a man in his 50s in Langborough Road. Mark has never been seen since. Well, Detective Superintendent Tony Miller, I said it was a long shot, perhaps, to expect new information and new witnesses one year on, but in fact you've had a lot of calls. Indeed, I'm very, very pleased. We've had over 100 calls at the studio, and I know that at Reading Police Station we've received in excess of 200. Have you had any sightings of that hitchhiker, the most important one? I'm pleased to say also that we've had a lot of those calls relating to that hitchhiker, at least 50 at this studio. I'm not sure about Reading. And to recap, we should remind people that um, he's carrying a tachograph, he was carrying a tachograph, and it was June the 1st. It was June the 1st, he was carrying the tachograph. He was described, as the viewers will recall, as 5 feet 8 to 10, 50 to 60 years of age, grey hair, medium build, with prominent cheekbones, and at that time a beard growth. Mm, and maybe with or maybe without glasses, we don't know. In indeed, we're not sure about Somewhere that. Somewhere between Stockbridge. But of course, I reiterate what I said before, I want to hear from anyone who has offered anyone employment of that description. In in addition to that, uh, as a, a last appeal, I would like to remind the people that Mark was wearing a coat very similar to this in Wokingham that evening. I would like to hear from people who may have seen Mark around the town and indeed from people who were at the fair that evening. Mr Miller, thank you. Thank you. And uh, to see what's happened on the incident desk, here's uh, Helen Phelps and um, David Hatcher. David, can we start with the men who were caught in the act by the camera robbing three buildings at Society offices in Birmingham? Yes, that looks very promising. We've had suggested identif identifications of the two men from policemen and members of the criminal fraternity. And we can see those two pictures again. The man on the right is the man who had the gun in the raid that we saw. He's five foot eight and well built. The second man, believed to be wearing a false beard and moustache, he's five foot six, slim, short, dark hair. If you think you know who he is, still give us a call. We'll welcome any other suggestions. OK. And the robbery in Beaconsfield that took place while there was a bomb scare going on. Yes, that's right. There are a number of calls uh, suggesting a possible outlet for the stolen dresses and shoes. And remember, the names there were Jasper Conran, Roland Klein and Caroline Charles dresses, and the 300 pairs of designer shoes by Charles Jourdain. Uh, if you think you may have bought something like that, then give us a ring. Better that you come to us than we come to you. I gather several people have suggested where they're on sale at the moment. That's right, yes. Right. And what's this you've got here? And the other thing is, now, I was most sceptical about this. Didn't think we'd solve the problem of the jemmy because there must be lots like this but we think we found the shop that sold this in Brixton a small hardware store obviously inquiries to follow up there but that looks extremely promising and I'm 
very pleased. Right. Can we move to David Beatles? The two of you were asking for any information about him in connection with the £168,000 uh, fraud he's wanted for inquiries. Any information? Yes, many sightings of the man in Cornwall and Somerset. Now, the West Country link is interesting, as it was initially thought he was in that area. Now, one caller has requested the photo fit picture again, believing he has had very recent contact with the man. Right. Now, one of the most frightening things that you talked about was the Whittington Hospital fire in North London. Someone, it seems, deliberately set fire to a hospital just a few yards from patients who were acutely ill. Any information? Yes, one very promising call. Um, a person took photographs of the fire. He was at the scene. Now, it is known that arsonists do stay and watch their handiwork, so these photographs will be scrutinised very soon by the officers in the case. Right. Helen David, thank you. And finally, the violent armed robbery of antique dealers Wallace and Mary Foster in Weybridge in the early hours of Monday, April the 22nd. Remember we showed you how the day before the attack, two men were seen outside Church House Antiques. Now they were clearly there to take a close look at the shop because after a few moments they walked back in the direction they'd come from and police were hoping to trace them. Detective Superintendent Gladwell, there were a lot of clues there. Have you had a good response? Yes, we've had a very, very good response, in excess of 100 calls in all, um, and a few uh, into Adelston Police Station regarding the people seen on the Saturday evening. Any chance of tracing those two men? Um, well, it's early days yet, um, obviously the inquiries are yet to be made. What about those cars? They're very distinctive, a Jaguar and a Rover. Yes, we've had a number of calls regarding these vehicles. Um, one person suggested that a Jaguar and a Rover fitting the description of our two vehicles, were put up for sale at auction on Tuesday of this week. Would you be able to trace who put those up for auction? Um, well, we've got to look into that, of course. And what about the jewellery? There are two very distinctive pieces of jewellery. Yes, again, we've had a very, very important call on this um, from a member of the public who has given us details um, of a possible receiver. Right, and finally, the vital clue, that canvas bag which the robbers left behind, is that going to be traceable? We, yes, we've had a lot of calls regarding the number on the bag, um, and most of the calls suggest that uh, it's a service number, possibly a naval number. So it could well be traceable? Yes, indeed. So to sum up what we're looking for? Well, we're looking for two violent criminals who committed a very serious offence, and I would urge anyone who has got any information, no matter how small, to contact us. Thank you, Mr Gladwell. In fact, I gather there's another important call just come in on that. Now, the lines are going to be open until midnight. Uh, the number, of course, 01811 8055 will give you local numbers in a moment. All these numbers are on CFAX, if you have it on your television, on page 186. Or alternatively, you could write to us in absolute confidence, of course. This is the address, Crime Watch UK, BBC Television Centre, London W12 8QT. Thank you very much uh, for calling if you did. Let me remind you that what we've shown you tonight is the exception. It's not the norm. Violent crime really is much rarer than most people think. With your help, we can make it rarer still. Do sleep well. Uh, if you can't sleep, I promise you you are in good company because uh, Sue is going to have to stay up. She's on breakfast time tomorrow morning. It's tough life, isn't it? Good night. Good night. Yeah.